Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for coming um, to the candidate orientation that we're putting on today. This is really uh, about you guys and getting you the information that you need and trying to address uh, and answer all of your questions. Because um, I know there are, there are a lot of questions that you all have. There's a lot of issues um, you know, with the city, with finances, and so we're going to cover some of those things today. And really we put together today's agenda based on the feedback that we received from you on the topics that, that, you, wanted to, uh, that you wanted to hear about. Um, the other thing I would say is, is thank you for running. Um, this can be uh, a very difficult uh, and challenging um, position, and we're, we're very happy that there are citizens out there who want to take this on um, because it is, so, it is such a challenging position to be in. You really have to make some difficult decisions sometimes, and so thank you for being involved uh, in the process. Uh, I am the, the Reno City Manager. Uh, my name is Andrew Klinger. I've been here for uh, 10 months um, in the city. Prior to that, I actually worked for uh, the governor for six years. Um, started right as started as the governor's budget director, right as revenue peaked, and left right as revenue hit the bottom. So um, went through that challenge, and now I'm here in the city of Reno, putting together uh, what I think is a great team to help the city uh, manage the challenges that the city faces. And you you are all well aware. Uh, of what those challenges are. You're going to hear some of those challenges today. You're also going to hear on some of the solutions that we're putting together uh, to deal with those challenges. Um, as I stated, this, this session is meant to, to handle your questions, so if you have questions as we go, um, please, don't be, please feel free to, uh, to ask those questions. If you do have additional questions um, later on that don't get answered today, uh, we would ask that you address those questions to the city manager's office, and I'll give you a number um, that you can call if you do have additional questions. It's 334-2020. So if after today's session, if you have follow-up questions or just questions in general over the next month or so um, that you have, please feel free to call us. Uh, we'll direct you to the appropriate department um, to get your questions uh, answered. We did conduct a survey, um, as I stated, and by far the, the two most important topics um, that, that we got back that everybody wanted to hear about was the city's financial situation um, and also about public safety. So we do have presentations um, today that are going to address both of those, uh, both of those issues. Um, to start off today, we're actually going to have Chris Good, uh, our Director of Neighborhood Services. He's going to give you just an overview um, of the city. Uh, we have Chief Hernandez, who is going to give you an overview of the city's fire department. Um, and then we actually have Deputy Chief Mike Wan, um, who's going to, or sorry, Dave Evans. Mike was here last night. Uh, <laughs> Mike did a stellar job, by the way, so he set the bar high. So, yeah. Um, Deputy Chief Evans is going to give you an overview uh, of the Reno Police Department. And then we have uh, Robert Chisel who is our finance director, and Kate Thomas, who is our budget director, are going to give you uh, an overview of the city's finances. So unless you have questions uh, of me at this time, I'm actually going to turn it over to Chris uh, to give you an overview of the city. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> We are going to get to those topics that you asked for, uh, public safety and finances, but we thought it, it might be worthwhile to quickly give you an overview of the city government and the basis upon which it, it functions. Um, my name is Chris Good. I'm the Director of Neighborhood Services for the city. Uh, neighborhood Services includes the Neighborhood Advisory Boards, and that's the, the two staff liaisons for the Neighborhood Advisory Boards, Lisa Mann and Barbara DiCiano. Um, they're the two who kind of put this afternoon's program together as well. So I want to thank them for that. Uh, neighborhood Services also includes the Reno Direct Call Center. Uh, you can call or email Reno Direct for anything you need from the city. Uh, my department also includes media relations and television production and the website and social media. So we're very active out of Neighborhood Services. With that said, let's take a quick overview regarding how city government works in Reno. Um, we are established by a charter, so you can think of the city's charter like, like the Constitution for the federal government, and you can find the charter online. I would encourage you to do that. Um, you can get to it if you go to reno.gov and look under departments and go to the city clerk's office because, as you'll hear in a few moments, the city clerk's duties include keeping all the records 
um, all the records historical and otherwise for the city. Um, so if you go to the city clerk's page on Rito.gov, there's a link right there to the municipal code. If you open that up, you'll see that the first chapter of the municipal code is the charter. Uh, so I do encourage you to take a look at that. The charter was established in 1903, and there's an interesting little story there. We were originally chartered in 1899, but the charter was taken away. We were de-incorporated uh, because there weren't enough uh, people. The population wasn't large enough in Reno at that time. But uh, that changed by 1903, and the legislature established the charter for us in 1903. It's been amended a number of times, obviously, in, in that last 100 years. Um, but that charter has stayed with us through that whole time. But it's important to understand that it was the legislature that established us. The legislature granted us the city charter. So the city is, a, is the daughter of state government, as it were. We only have rights and authority that is conferred upon the city by the state government. Uh, the state government could, again, unincorporate us should they so choose. We only exist by the grace of the state government. Uh, the charter sets forth all the rules, um, how we elect our officials, how we do contracts, how we pass resolutions and ordinances, all, you know, who the officials, not, not individually who they are, what the officials are, and uh, what the duties of the officials are. That's all laid out in the charter. So anytime we come to a, a basic fundamental question about what we can and can't do, you always go back to that charter. That's the, the founding document. Um, an important point, last point about this before we go to the next slide is that uh, Broadly speaking, there are two types of city governments in the country, uh, those with home rule and those without. We do not have home rule. What does that mean? Home rule, if, if a city has home rule, basically, simply, it means that the city council, the legislature, legislative branch of that local government, has any rights that aren't precluded by state law. So unless the state law says you can't do this, or the U.S. Constitution says you can't do it. They have the authority to do it, to pass the laws. They could make it 75 miles an hour speed limit on Virginia if they wanted to. Uh, in a non-home rule city like Reno, and like all the cities in Nevada, it's the other way around. We only have the rights that are authorized and granted to us by the state legislature. So it's more restrictive. Um, that's why, that's one reason why it's so important that the local governments have a close relationship with uh, representatives in state government, that we have to work well together on a regular basis. The powers granted to the city council by charter, there's a little section in the, in the charter that, that explicitly says these are the powers granted to the council. And, and basically, again, I would encourage you to take a look at this because this is very simplified, but it's the power to buy and sell real property, to issue business licenses for, for uh, revenue, uh, to have franchise agreements with utilities and transportation. And here's my favorite part of the charter is that it, it provides for a municipal band. <laughs> I don't know how many city charters in the country uh, provide for a municipal band, but there it is explicitly laid out that the city council may appropriate money to uh, pay for and to promote a mun municipal band. And then one sentence uh, gives them the power, uh, police power, fire, uh, traffic, health, and sanitary. Um, I'll read you that. It says, uh, the power to enact and enforce any police, fire, traffic, health, sanitary, or other measure which does not conflict with, its, with state law. Um, so again, we go back to that restrictive nature of our charter. Our charter sets us up with the council slash manager form of government. Now, often when people think about city governments, they think about large cities, uh, particularly the ones back east, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta. And in those cities, they have a strong mayor. That's an older form of local government than a council manager form. In, in a strong mayor city, um, stereotypically, when a new mayor gets elected, he or she comes in and and wipes out the management of the city, puts in his or her own supporters, the people who helped that person get elected, the people who have supported each other politically over the years, and we have political appointees doing the day-to-day -day functions of the city. That's not how it works in a council manager form of government. And you, and you can see there are advantages and disadvantages to these different types. In the strong mayor form, the thought was that the, the electorate has a direct control and they, they put new people in office and that's going to change how garbage gets collected in Ward 3 when you, when you put someone who's interested in how garbage gets collected in, on the city council. 
Um, and, and that has its advantages, as I, as I say, but those disadvantages include the political machines that we saw rise at the end of the 1800s uh, in the larger cities back east. Um, to the victor goes the spoils, was the theory, and that led to what was perceived, and often was, uh, corruption. It doesn't have to go that way, but often it did lead to corruption. So that led to a, a new movement in the early 1900s um, of the rise of the technocrats, the idea of scientific management. And that idea produced this council slash manager form of government. And the thought here is the people who get elected are responsive to, to the voters, of course, and they set policies in place about what direction the city should go in. But the day-to-day -day operations are, are carried out by trained, professional, objective people who are um, professional city administrators, like in our case, Andrew Klinger, our city manager. Um, this goes back to the concept of scientific management that was big in the early 1900s. Um, this became a very popular way of setting up local governments, um, particularly after World War I in the United States. And today, about 40% of all local governments in the U.S. with populations of over 2,500 people are set up with this council slash manager form of government. And again, the thought here is that it's like is if the city were a ship, the city council and the mayor would be the captain of the ship. And they would say, we want to go over here toward that island. And we administrators who work for the city manager, um, we put our hands on the oars and we row and we go in that direction. We do the day-to-day -day work to get the city in the policy direction that the council and the mayor set. But we're not political partisans. We don't stump for candidates like you would in a strong mayor form of government. Um, the idea is to be apolitical, objective administrators. And that's the basic idea behind a council slash manager form of government. So the council establishes policies, passes ordinances and resolutions, appropriates the money, the power of the purse, that's very important, of course. Uh, and they have two employees, the city council and the mayor, two employees, the city manager, whom you met, Andrew Klinger, and the city clerk. And that's all laid out in that uh, city charter. The charter lays out the elected officials. Uh, it says we'll have uh, uh, one mayor, six city council members, as I'm sure you're familiar. Uh, it also says that there will be um, one municipal court judge and as many additional municipal court judges as the city council and the mayor determine is necessary. So right now we have four municipal court judges. The other elected official described in the charter is our city attorney, John Cadlick. They're pictured on the right hand, as you, uh, on your right, as you look at the, at the photographs there. Uh, and, and it's just interesting to point out the city attorney, I, I always like to make this point. Um, I worked in another city years ago where the city attorney was appointed by the city manager. That's different from here. Here, the city attorney is elected. Uh, now, the city attorney advises the mayor and the city council on, a, on sometimes a daily basis, but certainly at all their, at all their meetings where they make determinations and, and they want to make a change to the proposed ordinance, they turn to the city attorney for legal advice and counsel. Well, who is the city attorney's client? I just find this an interesting question. The, the city attorney in our case is elected, so you could say that his, his in this case it's a he, his client is uh, the voters of Reno, and that's appropriate and fine. Uh, but he also advises the administration and he also advises the elected officials. And you can imagine um, conflicts arising there. And I think that's interesting. And in, in my experience back in a different state in a smaller city where the city attorney was appointed by the city manager, there arose a conflict because that our city attorney believed the city manager had done something illegal. It got to be a big, ugly scandal and a mess. Uh, but the city attorney spent some of that time while, while I was there explaining to me his he was torn about who his client is. Is it the public? Is it the elected officials? Or is it the person who appointed him? So in this case, let's go back to fundamentals here. Our charter sets out that the city attorney is elected. So his, his uh, client, in this case, is the, uh, the electorate, the voters themselves. Let's go back to those two, two employees that the city council has, the city manager and the city clerk. The, the charter sets out the duties of the clerk Lynette Jones is the current uh, city clerk. She is responsible for running elections, for codification of all the ordinances that the city passes, that the council passes, 
for keeping of all the public records, as I mentioned, the collection of revenues, the parking permits and fees. She also runs the print shop that we have uh, in charge of uh, council support and the appeals hearing. So if you've ever appealed a parking ticket, um, that's uh, administered through the city clerk's office when you go and talk to the appeal officer about the parking ticket. Uh, in addition to these two employees, I'm about to get into what the city manager does in a moment, but before I do that, in addition to these two employees, the city council and the mayor also have advisory boards and commissions. These people aren't paid, they're not employees, they're volunteers. Uh, they're appointed by the mayor and the city council and we have a number of boards and commissions. We have the neighborhood advisory boards, who most people are familiar with, but we also have lots of specialized boards. We have the, the Redevelopment Agency Advisory Board. We have the Senior Services Advisory Board. We have Arts and Culture Advisory Board, Historic Preservation, and right on down the line. If you're interested in looking at those, you can see a comprehensive list of all of them, again, uh, at reno.gov. If you just look for boards and commissions, it's right there. Now let's take a look at what the city manager at the city of Reno does. Now this, I should have said this at the beginning of the presentation. Every presentation you're gonna see today is available online, again, at reno.gov. If you go to the city manager's page, there are four presentations you're gonna see today and all four are available. So if you can't see, if you can't read this org chart here, take a look at it uh, online and you'll see. But basically the city manager has a number of direct reports uh, and, and then they have people who report to them. There are two assistant city managers, one who oversees the public works and parks and rec, community development and redevelopment functions. The other assistant city manager oversees government affairs. That goes back to how important it is for us to have a good relationship with the state government. Uh, then there's neighborhood services, that's me. Uh, the city council's agenda management and special projects out of the city manager's office and then special events. Other people who report to the city manager include the administrative staff um, up on the 15th floor, that's where the city manager's office is. There's the Office of Management and Budget, which includes budget, of course, and also our federal grants and federal legislative affairs. That's out of the OMB. Now please note uh, that different from some other organizations, our budget office is separate from our finance department. And that was put in place uh, actually relatively recently in order to establish some additional checks and balances um, so that they're looking at each other's work. And you're going to see here from the dynamic duo here of uh, Kate Thomas and Robert Chisel, um, OMB and Finance, here a little bit later this afternoon. Uh, then we have the Director of Finance and Administration, that's Robert Chisel. Uh, he oversees finance, of course, but also human resources and our IT department. And then we have the fire department, the public, uh, and, the, and the police department. And you're gonna hear uh, from fire and police this afternoon as well. Every year, uh, our city manager pulls our city council and mayor off for a special workshop to establish priorities for the coming fiscal year. Our fiscal year starts July 1, so we're approaching the beginning of the new fiscal year. Uh, in February, in fact, it was Leap Day, February 29th, uh, the mayor and council went off on a workshop uh, and established these six priorities for the coming fiscal year. The first four of these are carryovers from the current fiscal year. Financial management, that's obviously a high priority for us as well as many other local governments across the country these days. Financial management has been a big issue, quite obviously. Economic development is a big priority and goal for the mayor and council. Public safety remains a priority for our mayor and council and arts and culture and special events. And then for next year, they added a special focus on senior services and accessibility. With that, that is a very brief overview of how the government is organized and how it works. And I would just remind you, um, I might be repeating myself, but it all comes back to that charter. And I would encourage you to take a look at that city charter online. Um, now, there's a, there's a space at the end of our program for Q&A, so I'd like you to, to, to save your, your questions, if you have any, until we're done with the presentations, with the exception of the next presentation, because this afternoon at 2.30, there's a joint meeting between the City of Reno and Washoe County to discuss fire deconsolidation and, and the fire functions moving forward come the first of the new fiscal year. So, Fire Chief Michael Hernandez is going to have to maybe leave this place early if we go a little bit over time. So I'd like to introduce Fire Chief Hernandez and encourage you to ask him your questions uh, 
while you have him up here before he has to run. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I am Mike Hernandez, the fire chief, and I've got a, um, a brief PowerPoint that basically goes over what our department is, what we do, how we do it, how we're staffed, what our budget looks like. I could probably take up the entire two hours um, just trying to address the variety of issues that are currently facing our department. And I, in a nutshell, I can tell you that we've got some serious challenges. Uh, this is a very difficult time for our organization, but we do have a plan in place, and our plan is um, centered on core service delivery to the citizens of Reno. We are, we're zeroed in on that, and we're making sure that on July 1, uh, the citizens of Reno will not see any type of difference in terms of service delivery. Uh, and then I'll, I'll hit probably the most common questions that I, I get asked every single, um, every day almost, and then I'll take whatever questions you may have. So with that, uh, what is the Reno Fire Department? Well, the Reno Fire Department is an all hazards department, and what that means is that we are capable at present, and we will be capable in the future of responding to all types of disasters, whether man-made or natural. Whether that's a, a, a significant EMS response, as we had in the um, Reno Air Race disaster, uh, a, a conflagration uh, like, like we had at the Collin and the Washoe fire, or a day-to-day -day structure fire. Uh, just last week, we had two concurrent structure fires, and we are building a fire service delivery model uh, that is capable of handling two significant events at the same time. Uh, and then lastly, we do uh, what we call our special operations, water rescue, high angle rescue, confined space, and of course, hazardous materials. So that's kind of that's what we mean when I say we, have, we are an all hazards, all risk management type department. We can, you know, whatever mother nature throws at us, we are in some way, shape or form prepared to respond to those type of events. Uh, whatever, any type of natural, I'm sorry, man-made uh, disaster, whether it's, a, it's an 18-wheeler coming down I-80 that flips over and is loaded with gasoline, we are prepared to respond to those types of events. So what do we do? We do, you know, fire response, which is structural, wildland, vehicle, and chemical. EMS. <clears throat> we are part of a two-tiered EMS delivery system. We work in concert or in partners with REMSA. REMSA typically has anywhere between seven to nine ambulances, uh, depending on how they up and down staff uh, their medical system at any given time. We have uh, our stations strategically placed throughout the city. All of our personnel are trained to at least the intermediate level, the EMT intermediate level. We have approximately two dozen paramedics currently on staff. Uh, that, that also ride the ambulance. So the, mo the most common question I get is, Chief, why is it that when I picked up the phone and I call for a paramedic because my mom or dad or my brother or sister collapsed or fell or broke his leg, uh, a fire truck showed up? And, and the short answer is we are l generally closer in proximity uh, to be able to provide that hands-on intervention type therapy prior to the arrival of REMSA. Now, sometimes they get there before we do, they cancel us. Sometimes we get there before they do, and we recognize the need that there isn't an ambulance required, so we cancel them. Oftentimes, we arrive just slightly ahead of them, and it's the type of event that's a labor type, very labor intensive type event. A classic example is we have a, a very large individual that's in their upstairs um, uh, room, and we have to bring them down a flight of stairs. That's a very difficult challenge for just two people. So we provide that labor type backbone assistance as well as the first response uh, that complements the EMS uh, model that we currently have here in, in, um, in the city of Reno and Washoe County. Uh, we respond to a, a variety of hazardous materials events. Uh, the most significant we ha uh, event that we had uh, this past year was out in Fernley. Uh, their water treatment facility, uh, they had a major breach. Uh, it filled uh, their facility with acid. Uh, we initially responded and we, we mitigated it or we, we controlled the leak, uh, but the event was so large that they, it exceeded their capacity at their level to handle and, and mitigate, so we were actually on scene for almost a week. Uh, fortunately, the city of Fernley did reimburse all of the, the costs uh, that the city of Reno incurred. And uh, when you talk about the, the hazardous materials team, it's not just the city of Reno. We have what's called the Triad Hazmat Team. Washoe County contributes a portion, uh, Sparks, City of Sparks contributes a portion, and then the city of Reno contribute a portion annually to a standalone budget that's specifically dedicated to hazardous materials response equipment, training, and, uh, and, um, per and part of personnel. So we provide the, the manpower, 
The triad contributions pay for the training and the equipment, and it's a very effective program and one that we, we hope continues on. Uh, with respect to special operations, of course, we do fire rescue. Uh, we have a very uh, robust water entry team. Uh, we, in the first month of last summer, it was a warm summer. We had some significant runoffs in the river. In one month's time, we executed over a dozen actual water rescues, and that was more than we did the previous year combined for the summer. So uh, as you probably read in the paper, and, and yesterday our water teams are already out there training uh, for the spring, you know, warmer temperatures. Uh, high angle, th these are our special operations team. High angle, uh, whether it's the side of a mountain or the side of a building, we have the capability to actually extricate uh, an individual that may become either trapped, injured. A real common example is you, you, know, you see the window washer folks out there and they'll have a malfunction with uh, some of their equipment and they'll be dangling off of a, of a scaffolding, you know, you know, 25 stories up. We have the capability of actually going up and, and bringing those folks down. In fact, sometimes they, they practice over at Comro. Uh, confined space is the exact opposite. That's where um, you have uh, a trench. Uh, we had an incident um, on the 395 extension. Uh, just past West Washoe Valley where an individual fell down a, um, a manhole cover that was left open. He fell approximately 20 feet. He shattered his hip, broke his leg. Uh, we had to physically go into the pit and uh, extricate him. We had to package him and make sure that he was stable and then we, we slowly brought him up. It took us about three hours. So that's an example of our uh, confined space capabilities. We do have some specialty rescue capabilities. Uh, oftentimes you hear us use the term that we use the jaws of life. Uh, we have special equipment that allows our teams to um, extricate people out of cars, uh, heavy machinery, uh, you know, farm equipment. I mean, you name it. There's, there's. A, if a person can get in trouble and, and, you know, get compromised, we respond to those type of events. The last portion of our department is the the Fire Prevention Bureau, and they're in charge of prevention, code enforcement, inspections, uh, to include safety education and juvenile juvenile intervention. Um, <coughs> What, um, what our focus is with the prevention bureaus is to make sure that as we move forward with development, it's, it's in alignment with our existing codes and uh, the inspection portion makes sure that we, we divide up our, our community into three major categories, high risk occupancies, nursing homes, hospitals, schools, uh, theaters, concert venues, things like that, medium risk and low risk. And, and we're basically on a three year rotation. We take those high risk occupancies and we make sure that we hit those or we, we inspect those occupancies every year. Medium risk every two years, low risk, sometimes it's like a convenience store. Uh, we make sure that they're on a, at least a three year rotation. Um, as 2011 calls for service, we responded to uh, just, uh, just over 37,000 calls. Uh, 245 of those were structure fires. Um, almost 30,000 uh, were EMS calls. And, and uh, we had uh, 300 wildfires and approximately 343 hazardous materials calls. Now, not all of those hazardous materials calls were in the city of Reno proper. As I mentioned, we're part of a triad team, so often we go outside of our jurisdiction to help our neighbors uh, with respect to uh, hazardous materials incidents. Of the EMS calls that we responded to, over 2,000 of those were motor vehicle accidents. The second common question I get is why is it that the latter company responded to a motor vehicle accident? It was a minor fender bender, and there's this large fire truck there. And, um, and you know, why did it go? Remza was there, and we saw all these people kind of standing around, and they were back slapping each other and shaking hands, and there really wasn't a lot going on. Well, a lot of that is explained basically when, when you call 911. I don't know if anybody's ever called 911 for any type of an emergency, but the, the 911 system receives multiple calls for the same event. And the dispatcher or the call taker will receive a call and it'll come in something to the effect of, I'm on 395 and I just passed uh, two cars that have collided and I saw one car had four persons in it and they're kind of off to the side of the road and there's this stuff leaking and I don't think they can get out of the car. And that's a real typical call to 911. And then, you know, of course that, that initiates the call to REMSA as well as the fire department because leaking fluids could be anything from gasoline to antifreeze. People in the car could be a potential for trapped victims. Now our fire apparatus carries the tools that we need to extricate those people. But we get very limited snippets of information and as that call taker 
gets more information and gets more information, we can, we can either scale down the response because oftentimes we'll dispatch the cavalry, if you will, and as she gets more information, another caller will say, oh yeah, they're getting out of the car, everybody looks okay, then they'll actually cancel the, the fire side of that response. But more often than not, we respond because we, we prefer to err on the side of safety. Uh, and then typically, you know, we arrive, we, we size up the situation. If we're needed, we stay. If we're not, we leave. Uh, and then again, you know, uh, there was an incident uh, just a, last week where two cars were, um, were involved. On, I think it was on Longley Lane. One car had four individuals. The other uh, car had two. It was a significant accident. Uh, you know, we had a total of six patients. So even for a, a single REMSA response, that would have overwhelmed their capabilities to manage those six incidents or those six patients. So we support that system by, you know, dispatching an engine company. We're all medically trained, and we help and we complement uh, the EMS model here in, in the Valley with respect to our responses. Um, our budget. I, I have uh, 1999 there because that was our budget prior to consolidation, and, and I'm gonna, we're going to compare that to where we're going uh, post-deconsolidation come July 1. Uh, in 1999, we had a $23 million budget. Uh, in 9-10, I'm going back three years, uh, we peaked at 49. 10-11, we saw a reduction in force and a reduction in our budget to 45. 11-12, uh, we saw a further reduction in force as well as a reduction in our budget to $39 million. Overall, we've taken a 31% uh, reduction of our budget. And what that has caused us to do is not only have we laid off approximately 50, uh, just over 50 firefighters, uh, but we've had to brown out approximately three, sometimes four stations. Uh, and, and what a brownout is, it's a temporary closure of a fire station. Uh, there are times, today's a very good example, where our staffing is such that I'm able to open up more stations. Uh, station 4 by the university, Station 8 uh, further up the road is, is open. Station 10 uh, will likely uh, open later on this evening. Station 21 by the GSR is open. Um, the only one that I didn't open is Somerset and Skyline. But there are times when I do open up Skyline, especially if we, we perceive a, a threat and risk uh, from a wildfire incident. We'll get a dry storm coming in. The fuel loads are high. The lightning probability index is off the charts. We won't hesitate to call back crews and staff, staff our browned out stations. Uh, so what does that budget impact mean to our, uh, our full-time equivalents or our employees? Prior to consolidation, we had 255 full-time equivalents or employees. After deconsolidation in 910, we peaked at 386. Uh, we went through a reduction in force and we reduced that down. Some of those were through attrition and some of them, uh, those were through layoffs. Uh, we, uh, in, in 1011, we were at 264. We went through a second, um, a second round and then uh, in 2011 and in 2012 we are currently at uh, 266 and that was because uh, we applied for and received a safer grant, a federal grant that allowed us to hire back 10, uh, 10 firefighters. So currently we operate 13 stations and technically uh, we have one hybrid station in the south, that's a, that's a county station, it's in the Walmart, station 14. We staff that station, but the physical station, the physical property is that of, of the county. Uh, we have plans in place to, to stand up a south station as we move forward with plans to build a station, a more permanent facility in the south. Uh, the Truckee Meadows system is currently con consists of five stations, four in the North Valleys and one um, down in uh, West Washoe Valley off of East Lake Boulevard. So, what we are looking at is we are looking at a budget of $30 million, and what that is going to afford us is uh, 186 full-time equivalents. And what that means is that we will be able to operate 10, possibly 12 stations, depending on staffing. And staffing is impacted by sick leave, injury rates, military leave, maternity leave, and military leave. Uh, right now, our rates are, are well within standard parameters for an organization of this size. Uh, but we would basically mirror what we look like right now. We would likely have three, possibly four stations browned out, and I would have the ability to upstaff depending on threat and risk, and that's how I built my budget. So the most common, the most common question I get from this component is, uh, why are we laying off 80 people? Well, we're, we hope to main, retain as many as we can. We hope to retain as many as our budget allows. But what is currently going on is the county, and it's well within their right, to stand up their own department. They're in the process of standing up the Truckee Meadows Fire Protection District, and they are merging with the Sierra Fire Protection District. 
Their plan calls for uh, hiring of employees. We currently carry 65 employees on our books to supplement or to keep the Truckee Meadows stations open. Those employees have the option uh, of applying for and transferring into the Truckee Meadows Sierra system if they so choose. Some of our employees have elected to do that, some of them have not. Uh, where we're hitting a snag is that because the deconsolidation ends, or the consolidation ends June 30, and technically they begin their system July 1, that also coincides with our budget process. Because I don't know how many people are going to transfer, and, and frankly, and it's, it's no fault of the county, but they don't know how many they're going to hire or need, uh, and et cetera, we're kind of caught in this, in this gray no man's, no man's land. So I am forced to build my budget based on the fact that if no one left, if no one left the Reno system, I would have to reduce my force by 80 people. Now what we have done is we currently have a SAFER grant which allows for 10 positions to be funded and we have applied for an additional grant for the upcoming next two years. We, we are still waiting for official word on that grant and that has the potential to impact anywhere from 20 to 25 more positions. So again, depending on how many positions slide over into the, into the TM system, we could look at a very limited number of a reduction in force, if, if any at all. So again, it's a very, very flux type uh, situation. You know, we, you know it, it changes from day to day, and, and we monitor where our grant application process is daily. In fact, we had a conference call this morning to check on the status of that, that grant. So what does the future hold for us? Well, pursuant to the county, I'm sorry, pursuant to the, uh, the uh, city council's goals and direction that they provided at the, uh, out, at the uh, strategic planning session, it was clear that seniors need to be a focus for us. And, uh, and what we do very well is that we outreach to our school-aged children. And we do a lot of fire safety education in the schools. We are going to expand that. In fact, we are going to apply for a grant that will allow us to specifically target seniors with respect to fire safe behaviors. And uh, that grant will be broad enough to where we can dovetail in elementary school age children with respect to, you know, uh, stop, drop, and roll, uh, e exits called Operation Edith, exit drills in the schools. Uh, there's a whole host of programs that we, we, can, we, we hope to fund but we can currently uh, implement on a very limited scale. If we're successful with this grant, we will be able to really roll it out on a large scale. We'll have the funding for it, the personnel. Uh, and the, believe it or not, the biggest thing that the kids remember is when you give them little stickers and things like that, and that's where our largest cost is. So we're gonna aggressively pursue grants uh, with respect to equipment, staffing, as I mentioned, and there are grant opportunities for stations, specifically station rehabilitation grants, not necessarily new stations, although there are, there, there are out there. Uh, there are some fu federal funds available that if you've got an aging fire station uh, that qualifies and meets the parameters, we can apply for federal funds uh, that can help us rehab those stations. Now, the, 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 the flip side to asking for federal funds is very few grants are, are free. Uh, most of them require some form of a match. And it's either a hard cash dollar match or it's an, what we call an in-kind match. And an in-kind match is staff time has a certain value, administration of the grant has a certain value, so they take that in-kind value and apply it to meet the intent or the match of the grant. So a lot of people say we should go after federal money because it's free. Well, it's not necessarily free. And, and sometimes we don't want to let the tail wag the dog. We don't want to go after a grant specifically just because a grant is there and all of a sudden we're having to teach widget education to you know, first graders. So we're very careful and very cognizant of what's out there, what's available, and does it meet the criteria uh, that our council has directed us to, um, to follow. We want to continue with our special teams capabilities, hazmat, technical rescue, and water rescue. We, want to, we, we currently are moving towards a very high-profile customer-based service organization. Uh, and I know it, that sounds kind of fluffy and pretty, but really what that means is when our people show up, we want to make sure that we meet our customers' needs. And a, and a very good example is, is right after the Colin fire, it took us almost a week to fully extinguish that fire. We were out on the, on the scene for a fire. But what a lot of people don't know and re, a lot of people don't recognize is that for the, for the following month, for almost 30 days, 
We had our crews literally going street to street, block to block, neighborhood to neighborhood, checking on individuals that had their homes impacted in some way, shape, or form to ensure that there wasn't some type of unmet need. Uh, we had individuals that their homes completely collapsed, and they had uh, mementos and things that they wanted, to, they wanted us to help retrieve certain things that were in their basement that they couldn't get to and we were able to get to so we we continued that outreach so that's what I mean when I say we're gonna we're gonna continue with our high-profile uh, customer service based organization we call them Mrs. Smith uh, we're looking at enhancing our EMS capabilities as we move forward we do have uh, some paramedics that are within our system and we want to make sure that our paramedics are, are equally trained to match the level of the paramedics that, uh, that currently work for REMSA. And we want to make sure little things like uh, the equipment that we use is compatible with the equipment that they use so that if we put a life, uh, um, a CPR, I'm um, sorry, uh, uh, a monitor, a heart monitor on you, we don't have to disconnect it so that they can put theirs on you. We want to be able to plug and play. We want to be able to unplug it from ours and plug it into theirs and off they go. Uh, so we're very, very cognizant of what our capabilities are, and we want to make sure that everything we do with respect to EMS is complementary to the REMSA model. And lastly, we want to outreach to the business community and special populations. Uh, most recently, we, we met with the senior, um, the senior, the Washoe County Senior Advisory Group, and, and we basically asked that group, what is it that the fire department can do specific to the seniors? Fire safety education, uh, assistance with smoke detector, even simple things like changing a battery uh, in a smoke detector is a challenge for a, a person in, of, of advanced age. So we want to make sure that we identify those needs in our special populations, and we want to make sure that if there's something we can do to accommodate that, we're doing it. Special populations, we have a, a broad uh, base of diversity in our community uh, to include the, the physically and, and hearing impaired, the mentally impaired. We want to make sure that if there's something that the department can do, at the very least, we need to outreach to these groups and leaders in those groups and to make sure that if there's a need that we can address, we're at least, it's at least on our radar. We may not be able to do something now, but it's on our radar. Questions? Yes, sir. Well, in, through the city manager's office, we, we advise him, we advise the city manager's office and, and his staff of available grants and whether or not they're applicable. Uh, it's our job to make sure that, that we know what's out there, and we do. Uh, Maureen McKissick, she's the young lady back there in the red. She's um, our, our governmental liaison person. She also works closely with those grant funds that are out there. But actually, at this time, we do, um, short of having somebody that, that looks for, for uh, private sector grant funding opportunities. Uh, we cover most of those bases relatively well. And should you be elected, you could always tell the city manager he can increase my budget. So, <laughs> just a subliminal hint there. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, the triad is, is a separate program. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten to that level of discussions yet because uh, the county is moving relatively quickly and standing up their, par their department. And I think, uh, again, I can't speak for the, the TM system, but I think that their focus is let's get our stations open, let's get them staffed, and then we can worry about some of these other things. And, and the city of Reno is not going to turn our, our, the back on, on the county. I mean, if, if we have a rescue situation out in the county, we're not going to say, you know, we're not going to thumb our nose at them and say, hey, too bad. You know, we're, we're going to do everything we can within our powers to assist our neighbors. There's been a lot of stuff in the media that, you know, it, uh, it's been a bitter, ugly divorce. And, you know, and we're now on eHarmony.com and we're taking dates and that kind of thing. But uh, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, uh, I'm committed, our department is committed to ensuring that our community is protected. Uh, you know, the issue of automatic aid and mutual aid, which are two different concepts, uh, has been a bit contentious and rightly so. The city manager through the uh, direction of the council has directed me to make sure that when we enter into or even discuss automatic aid that it's equitable and that there is an, an undue uh, burden placed on the taxpayers and the citizens of Reno in providing primary service to, in, you know, to geographic areas that are, are the responsibility of the county. Uh, it, it, it's kind of grown into this huge uh, nuclear debate, but uh, the bottom line is, you know, is as a city council person, would you authorize me to spend city of Reno taxpayer money 
to provide primary service to an area that is already taxed and, and money going to a separate governmental entity. And, and we've tried to have some, um, some reasonable discussions with respect to that, uh, that issue. And, and we've made some movement. You know, we've agreed on the, the, the concept of mutual aid, and, and that was never really an issue. Uh, you know, if, they, if, if any entity, whether it's Carson, Sparks, Truckee Meadows, Sierra, uh, North Lake Tahoe, if they pick up the phone, they call me and say, Chief, we need some help. Can you send us an engine? We're going to send an engine. And likewise, we've done the same. So. The Hayek, the Hayek group, yes. Which report? Correct. I'm not familiar with, with Tom's, yeah, I'm not familiar with Tom's report. He's a pretty prolific writer and he's, uh, I, I know Tom. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm not exactly sure which report you're talking to, but but the Hyatt Group has been very concerned about. Um, um, and for those of you that don't, are, does everybody know who Tom Motherway and the Hyatt Group is? They're kind of a, a kind of a conservative think tank, a lot of philosophical, deep thinking type folks, um, and and they look at uh, emergency services, not just fire, but all emergency services to include EMS delivery globally uh, with respect to how that is being delivered in the county and and they um, they kind of promote different alternatives uh, that are economical cost effective timely and those type of things and uh, we you know I, I, I know Tom personally and, and we talk and and um, you know sometimes we have philosophical differences of opinion but you know I, I respect his and yeah, I re well, you know, but he's he's also my constituent, so I, I listen to his concerns and um, and and try and provide as much information as I can. But um, as the fire chief, I look at and and, and you know, Chief Evans will also echo that uh, Chief Pitts's concerns first and foremost are the protection uh, of our citizens because that's our job. I mean, that's that's number one. That's why when you walk into a fire station and you ask them who's Mrs. Smith, they're going to turn around and point right at you. And, um, and, and that is our mantra. We do everything we can for Mrs. Smith because she's our customer. So, last chance before I go. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, it's my turn. So I'd appreciate a little enthusiasm since I haven't been impressing my boss, obviously, very much. So it's going to be a little high energy presentation. We'll wake you up here. Um, it's my pleasure to present to you on behalf of uh, Chief Pitts. Um, what we've done is kind of prepared. There's a lot of information here. We'll go through it as quick as, quickly as we can. We'll certainly try to stay within our time frame. Uh, but we wanted to, to kind of give you a first uh, a snapshot of, uh, of the last three years. And, and through this whole presentation, this is a, a snapshot of the last three years of what we've been doing. And we really wanted you to get, get an idea of what your police department's been, uh, been doing, uh, not really hunkering down and trying to weather a storm that may not end. We've, we've, we've actually implemented a lot of strategies. So kind of what we've been dealing with, these are the challenges, reduction our budget by 12 million over the last three years. That, that number there is what it currently sits at, reduction in grant funding by 60%. And I will tell you that we aggressively pursue grants. We have about 25 grants that we currently work. Probably 16 of them are really uh, continually funded now, and the other ones are kind of dying off. Uh, so th that is obviously nothing new to, to uh, the police department. It's happening everywhere. Our sworn numbers are down. Uh, we've lost 100 sworn police officers during those three years. Uh, and, and obviously the 284 is where we currently stand. Civilian numbers, uh, 58, so we're down 50 there, so almost half of our civilian uh, folks have been reduced. Um, our executive staff, we reduced by 70 percent uh, to uh, try to keep those jobs uh, on the street and keep police officers on the street. Closure of two substations, the North and Central, which has obviously uh, presented some challenges when it comes to customer service, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a later slide. Um, calls for stir, uh, service have stayed consistent, about 150,000 a year is what we respond to. Um, so those aren't really helping us out. They're not going down, although we'll show you some positive crime stats as we kind of go through there. Uh, and then our square mile, uh, miles that we still patrol. And the thing that uh, 
I want to kind of highlight here. Let's see here. I don't know. Okay. No. I'm obviously not. Didn't come here in practice. Um, so the strategies that we implemented, um, and just so you know, we got together as an executive staff and we talked about uh, the ov overall desire to create a culture of people who, where we can build the capacity for them to adapt in a rapidly changing environment that we've been going through for three years. So some of the ideas that we decided to kind of implement three years ago to create that culture are up here on the screen. So the first thing we did is we created the guiding principle work groups. And those are the things that we said we were going to be the very best at. And I don't think, yeah, looking at them, you could argue that we shouldn't be, as your police department, the very best at these areas. So we have intelligence-led policing. This is all of our data, our crime analysis uh, that we're, we're, we're actually pushing out to our officers every day so that they have the best information. Community policing and problem solving. Uh, we created a CAO team, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, we took it from two to ten people through grant funding right at the, at, at, the, uh, at the height of where we were making the cuts because we wanted to really focus on crime fighting and problem solving out in the community. And, um, and these folks do that every day. They, they work with the high uh, uh, risk locations and they come up with long-term strategies. Uh, we created the uh, customer service and uh, uh, personal safety committee. Uh, again, really hard to argue that we shouldn't be good at that. Innovation and technology, we know that we're going to have uh, challenges with technology. Um, our criminals are always advancing, and so uh, we've got to look for ways to continue to be progressive there. Leadership, which I think is one of the most important things that we did in those three years, is we, we recognize the need to, to talk about leadership and organizational family enrichment. Uh, we actually, uh, and as, as we get through there, you'll see what we've done with leadership, uh, which I think is, is, is something we're, we're benefiting from today. We, so the first thing we really had to do is we had to reorganize the, the uh, police department. And when you do something like that, uh, it's like the Apollo 13, throw it all out on the table, try to figure out what you're going to do. But we knew that we, weren't, we, we were still going to have to provide the best service, um, and it wasn't an option uh, to just say we're not going to give you something. And you'll never hear that from the Reno Police Department. You won't hear it on the, in the media. You haven't heard it for three years. Um, so what we decided to do is say, okay, our patrol staffing has got to stay strong. We rotated, as we lost positions, we moved those positions back into patrol, where we really sustained most of the casualties is on our support uh, side of it. So you have detective, uh, detective division, you know, the follow-up side of it uh, really took the most significant hit. Um, but when you pick up the phone and dial 911, you know, the, the assumption is you're going to get somebody there as quick as possible. So a lot of people didn't see a reduction in police cars on the street, that's why. Uh, it wasn't that we were, weren't losing police officers, that was where our pr priority was. We also, we also recognize the need to really develop our command staff um, and, and really kind of tap into the private sector because when we talked about adapting quickly in a rapidly changing environment, nobody does it better than the private sector. And so what we did is we established a chief's advisory board. Uh, we handpicked uh, a variety of people in the community that we thought uh, had a particular skill set that could help us develop. We could bounce questions off of. It wasn't a political board where we just had lunch once in a while. This is an actual working board where we talk about real problems and we get great ideas. And uh, it's really been uh, incredible over the last three years. And they're very dedicated to the Reno Police Department in the city of Reno. I keep doing that. Um, Chris, you're going to have to help me get this straight, I think. So anyway, um, we'll just keep going. Uh, we created the community action officer team. Uh, perfect. You're the technology guru, aren't you? That's right. Okay, so we created the uh, community action officer team. Like I said, this is the CAO team. We took it from two to ten. Uh, we have these people out working in every area of the city. They're assigned geographical locations in the city. And really what they do is they look for long-term problem solving. They're not the quick fix uh, teams. We have those, which we'll talk about in a second. But this is a team that kind of goes out, looks at more of the systemic issues. We use them uh, downtown for the panhandling issues, homeless issues, those kind of things where they can really look at what's, what's kind of feeding the ultimate uh, beast here, and we come up with a solution for it. And they work with all of the stakeholders. Um, and again, from 2 to 10, and, and we've had some great results there. And then obviously we, we decided to put in a branding stra strategy which focused on the way we're adding value to the community. Um, and, and those are through the other teams that we, uh, we created at that time, the, the crime suppression team. All as they do is they come in every day and support patrol on any active criminal uh, serial uh, deal that's going on. They get that information, they go out that day and they make arrests. And they work with patrol to do that. Of course, CAO, 
Uh, Code Baby is actually a uh, concept that we took from Colorado Springs, recognizing the need uh, to communicate better since we closed a couple substations with our, uh, our folks in the community. It actually walks people through the report writing system. It's an avatar dressed in a uniform, actually talks you through a police report, explains those processes because we felt like we were losing some of that. So uh, we, we implemented that. And then our crime fighting strategies in general are, are a daily discussion. Those are things, again, uh, we've got an incredible group of crime fighters in the last two or three years uh, just simply because we, we've made it a priority for them to go out and, uh, and concentrate on what's important to the community. Um, and then we, we started, like I mentioned, leadership is very important, obviously, with times uh, that, that we've gone through, the, the, the hits that we've taken. And we, we started the leadership challenge. At that time, we were taking all those cuts. We sent people to get trained, and we brought them back, and we developed courses for every level of the organization so that we could push leadership through and, and actually expect leadership at every level of the organization. Uh, it was the only way we were going to kind of get this concept of being able to move quickly and adapt if we give our folks the ability to make decisions without having to run it up the chain. This has been, I think, one of the most significant things we've done because we see it at every level now and it's really made a difference in our, in our culture. Robert? Okay. Perfect. I like this now. Okay, so obviously the other thing we did is we talk about budget all the time. We made it everybody's business. We push out information on a weekly basis to our divisions, our lieutenants that run those uh, divisions are getting information on every dollar that they're spending over time and they're managing it and we have staff meetings weekly where we hold them accountable for that. So we're talking about money all the time. Um, they're very fiscally responsible. We, uh, we, we took it upon ourselves uh, to schedule monthly meetings with our budget department, uh, Kate over there, so that we could sit down and make sure that we are being proactive, that there's not going to be something we're missing, um, and that we're, we're not going to be hit all of a sudden with a big shortfall where we're going to have to make some serious decisions. So um, by doing that, uh, it, it allows us to be a little bit more interactive with each other and we stay responsive to whatever we see coming. So uh, it's, th that's been a great uh, conversation that occurs every month. Um, and then we created the Reno Police Department Foundation. Uh, it's managed by the Community Foundation, which most of you are probably aware. They have, you know, probably 100 foundations, maybe more, I don't know. Um, and this was, again, recognizing the need that at some point we're, gonna ha we're not going to be able to have those, those revenue streams to buy and purchase the things that we're absolutely going to need to keep progressive. So we started this foundation for the simple fact is we, we, we wanted to be able to tap into some other resource if we needed equipment, training. Um, we all already have about six uh, uh, kind of areas that people like to give to, um, and we had separate funds for that. We just kind of wrapped it all in, and then we created a separate uh, area that would support training, education, um, equipment, stuff like that. So we're excited about that. We just got that going, and um, it's just another way uh, that we're looking to kind of capitalize on everything we can and the support we get in the community. So the implementation strategy uh, continued here. So we have a three-year strategic plan. We just worked through this. And what we did is we, we took some courses. Uh, we brought some information back from Cornell on scenario planning. And we said, we kind of did a cross-section of our organization. And we said, OK, not only are we going to do a strategic plan, and we thought three years was about as far out as we could possibly go with a strategic plan, but that what we're going to do is really challenge them to be more diagnostic, make them actually have to go through scenarios. And we put them through about 26 different scenarios that would play out the worst case scenarios, in some, in some cases, better scenarios, um, so that we already had strategies in place. We weren't doing that Apollo 13 in the final hour trying to figure out what we were doing. We already kind of knew what we would do if those hit. Those include uh, continual reductions in our budget. Uh, they include uh, increases in our budget. I mean, uh, the things that we want to keep paying attention to. Now, where those things will sit are in the guiding principle work groups that I talked about earlier. Some of that work will be monitored and, and constantly maintained by those groups. Other, others, especially the financial ones, will be monitored by the executive staff, and those are things that we talk about weekly. Um, and so we're, we're really proud of that. Um, we, uh, we learned a lot through that process, and I think we've got a really strong three-year strategic plan because of it. And then obviously developing strong relationships with the labor groups. As we were going through this, uh, we, we were talking with our labor presidents weekly. This is a huge leadership challenge as we went through a reduction in force, trying to negotiate a, a collective bargaining agreement. And this requires constant discussion and interaction with these groups. They trust us. They understood that it was a huge leadership decision to have to, to go in and make these cuts. The alternative was they weren't going to grow their, their organizations anymore. And we told them. 
take the sacrifice and we'll grow and we are growing again so th that's that's the positive thing and and so uh, that was the other really main relationship that we had to constantly work with as we went through this process but uh, but it's made us all stronger I think because of it so because of all those strategies, these are kind of the out outcomes that, that have occurred. So we created a culture which is more diagnostic, better under understands le leadership practices and behaviors, and which is supported at every level. We've got decision makers at every level, and, um, and, and we see it every day. We work through and settle the collective bargaining agreements. We've got a better uh, crime fighting group out there, I have to tell you, uh, because that's, that was the culture, crime fighting, problem solving. And we decided, you know what, every day everybody's going through uh, issues at home, at work, and if they come to work and they stay focused on progress, something that they're excited about, then we're going to have a better, happier workforce. And you got the best police officers out there right now that we can give you because that's all they do is make arrests, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Um, and so they have the best information. They share stuff, and we do this regionally. It's not just within the city of Reno. So the reduction of UCR crime rate, which are our major crimes, has been 22, almost 23 percent in, in that same period. So we're down 100 police officers, down 50 civilian support staff folks, um, and, and yet crime is, now this isn't, uh, this isn't, I'm not going to sit up here and pound my chest and say this is all Reno PD. This is a trend around the country right now. Most people are under the assumption, the perception in the community is that crime rate must go up because we have all these problems, but actually um, we're seeing a decline in it. Um, I like to think because we're working smarter and, um, and we're obviously, we've made that our focus, but I think that's something that, that we should be proud of. Obviously, we've, we've achieved fiscal responsibility at every, le every level. We will be balanced. Our budget will be balanced. We work on it every week to make sure it's balanced. We control our overtime and our spending. Um, we got great community support right now, and I think it's because we keep them informed. Uh, you haven't heard us tell them that we're not going to do something. We just figure out a way to do it. And obviously, uh, our survey results came back with an 82% approval rating, which, which is very good now. It's never good enough for us, but that, that is uh, very good. It's actually an upward trend, even though we've been going through some challenging times. So uh, we're very proud of that. And then we've got a command staff, which has developed over the past three years to be more adaptive and diagnostic as well, uh, which, which is going to make us all those experienced pilots that we all want to see at the cockpit at some point because uh, we've been through it. And there's really not much you can throw at us other than losing a, an employee and in some sort of tragic incident that would be harder than what we've been through in the last three years and we've come out of it even stronger. So, so moving forward, uh, obviously uh, the execution of the strategic plan is going to be important. That will be with the guiding principal work groups as I, as I said earlier. Uh, obviously, we want to grow the organization, and we're doing that. And it's, it's because of the hard work of the, of the unions and the administration to make this work, and obviously with the support of the city, that we are moving forward and slowly growing uh, again. We lost 60 people in, 40 mo in, in four months just through retirements, and we so that's a lot of organizational knowledge. So we, we need to grow again, and we are doing that now. Uh, focusing on public perception of crime issues and safety in the downtown Reno area, that's one of the hot topics right now. So you're going to see that you're going to see, especially over the summer surge operations. We're working on a city center project to uh, a substation for our downtown enforcement team, and to work those surge operations out of. And eventually, we, we see that as being a full service uh, substation again for our community to come in and, and take advantage of. Um, and obviously, working with the the uh, hotel owners and stakeholders in the downtown area. Uh, to come up and deal with some of these bigger problems, the panhandling stuff. We're putting signage down there uh, and coordinating the casinos and the properties with their video surveillance to kind of make it a more powerful uh, tool for us to use. Um, and then obviously we've also helped them establish a communication link between all the properties so they have a better, uh, a better opportunity to talk about the things they're seeing and what's going on on a daily basis and we just kind of, we're still working through those issues. So we're bringing in a uh, department-wide diversity training, a very, uh, a very substantial one that we're bringing in. It will be, uh, you know, they've, they've come in and done interviews. It's not just your run-of-the-mill uh, course. Uh, we're overdue for it, and, um, and we're proud, of, proud that we're able to bring that in. Um, we're looking to improve technology as it relates to crime fighting, evidence management, community networking, customer service. We took a little bit of, you know, we recognize we're, we're going to take a little bit of hit on the customer service follow-up side because of the casualties that we took in the detective and support divisions. That's just the, the uh, that's just what we have to do. So we're looking at ways that technology can help us close that gap a little bit 
Um, I just came back yesterday from, from a, a group that, that has a lot of great ideas to help us with that. And so we are, we are looking at ways that technology can help us kind of close that gap. Obviously, the leadership challenge is going to continue to go, uh, and we're pushing leadership at every level. That's not going to stop. We still have uh, a lot of people to get through that training. Uh, we're building uh, stronger networks in the community right now. We recognize those partnerships are going to become even more important uh, if we're going to be uh, effective. And then we're looking at things like developing an ambassador, ambassador program with youth. Uh, that we're partnering with the parks to kind of look at doing, um, again, to educate and brand uh, the city uh, and the various departments within the, within the city um, to the community during events and, and stuff like that so that we can continue to promote a nice, safe uh, city. Continue to support and grow both the crime-fighting and problem-solving strategies, CST, like we mentioned, the crime suppression team, uh, CAO and patrol initiatives uh, and technology, uh, those are things that we have to stay focused on. We have a guiding principal work group just to stay focused on those things. Uh, improve customer service through better education of programs. We recognize that although we put out a lot of information to the media, uh, they still, uh, you know, they're only picking up on the bad stuff. So we, we've actually just, just kind of worked through a branding strategy with the organization. So we're looking at those, those uh, uh, programs that are adding value in the community and that are, and we're going to look to highlight those achievements, either through our personnel or programs that we're doing. You're going to see more of that. We've got a Facebook page through YouTube. We've got a lot of, uh, of those uh, avenues that we're going to be kind of working on. But we recognize that uh, we've got to get this, more of this stuff out, because I, I guarantee you that most of you probably didn't know we were doing all this in the last three years. Um, but uh, the, the reality is, is we've got a great organization. Um, they're highly adaptive now, more so than they were three years ago. And um, as far as crime fighting goes, I put them up against any agency in the country. And I think they're happy to come to work every day. And, um, and so I'm happy to stand up here because I think uh, that we've got, we've got a great organization. That's it. So we're doing questions at the end, right? OK, thanks. I can just talk into this. Okay. So Robert and I kind of take a little bit of a different approach at first. We're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves because we're relatively new here to the city or back, depending on how you look at it. But um, I'm Kate Thomas. I'm the budget director. And I was with the city um, a number of years ago serving as the assistant to the city manager. And then I left and went to the state where I worked for Secretary of State Ross Miller for five years as his Deputy Secretary of State for Operations. So I had experience there overseeing budget and finance and accounting and HR and um, IT. And I've been back about five months now. So any really technical questions, I'm going to completely bail on you and get back to you. But um, that gives you a little bit of an idea of where we're coming from because Robert, too, um, comes from the state. Yeah. Uh, uh does this work? Yeah, okay. Uh, I just recently came from the Nevada Department of Transportation where I was the Assistant Director of Administration. And as I like to say, anything non-engineering was swept down the hall to my area. Um, I've been a 30-year resident of the city of Reno. I've actually been coming to this area with my family since the 60s. I'm a UNR grad, got my CPA in the early 90s. And you know, I'd like to say I'm really excited about the group we have here at the city. This is a very professional group um, that we have, and you're looking at some really great people, the police, the fire, um, the staff, and if you get to be council members, uh, you'll be pleased to have such a great staff working under you. So without further ado, do you want to get started? <laughs> sure. Um, this is a, and I'll let you run the thanks. First of all, we just start with the city purpose to kind of ground you and give you a, a direction for where we base all of our decisions financially off of the operations of the city and what we really need to be functioning as as a municipality. So on the next slide, we're going to show you what we lovingly call um, this presentation the doom and gloom presentation. We really are not trying to scare you off. It is just a very realistic picture of where we are as a city and where we have been in the last couple of years. Um, we are very heavily focused right now on financial sustainability. You saw in the council priorities that Chris Good had put up there. That's the top priority of the council at this time. And um, it's a little different than we were a couple of years ago where we were project-based and we were able to do kind of a lot more because we had those resources. But 
Uh, right now it's an all hands effort over and around financial and fiscal s stability and sustainability. So some of the challenges that you see up here we'll delve into a little bit more and, and they include reserve levels. Um, you know, we all know where revenues are going. Costs, you'll see kind of an example of, of if we do nothing where our costs will be headed. Robert will go into the captivating presentation on our debt. Um, we'll talk a little bit about unfunded liabilities, which is a significant issue for us and one that has come to bear recently in years where we have um, a, a, a new financial accounting um, requirement that has kind of shed some light on a pretty significant unfunded liability that we have that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, I mentioned sustaining core service levels. Where we want to be as a city really is one of those things that we're taking a hard and fast look at so that we can figure out um, in these lean economic times where do we want to shift some levels of um, service to the community? Or do we really need to do everything that we're doing? Do we need to do more? We're just taking a hard look at you know, what we should be at a foundational or core service level. Unanticipated expenditures are things that we consider natural disasters, another disaster we like to lovingly deem special projects. Um, those types of things kind of come into play outside of the budget cycle so they don't give us much time to prepare so we call them unanticipated. Fire deconsolidation I'm really not going to touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, regional economy and image though, we want to kind of let everybody know that it's important that we as a, as a city project ourselves to be fiscally and financially solid because it matters to other jurisdictions or other regions what Reno looks like in order to attract new development and new business here. So, you know, it kind of all hits down to that baseline um, of where we want to be and what we are as a city. So we'll delve into um, the reserves with a look at two different types. Ending fund balance and contingency are the two reserve levels that you'll be hearing about um, the most and when, when we talk about what we've got for safety nets and savings accounts per se at the city. Um, the next couple of slides will show you where we are with those. I'll give you a graphical depiction of what those look like. But um, we continue to take a hard, fast look at all of the revenues that are coming in, the expenditures that are going out, um, areas that we can improve. And the, the message and the mantra for this year, and then it will probably bleed over into the better part of next year, is basically we're asking all the departments, and they've done a tremendous job, of holding the line so that we can balance our continuing um, adjustments, if you will, in revenues, although they are looking a little bit better. Um, ad valorem or property tax is still on the downward slide. So, um, hold the line is really what, what the departments have done a great job as um, at and they are using a lot of mechanisms that I'll touch on a little bit later about how they are maintaining that line. So I mentioned the two types of um, contingencies and, and uh, reserves. General fund balance is the first um, one that I'm showing you here and basically what you're seeing is the blue line which is our ending fund balance and that is shown on the right hand side as a percentage of, you can see the percentages on the right hand side of your, of your screen there. The, the blue dotted line shows you where we were with ending fund balance as a percentage of the general fund revenues or the general fund expenditures for that fiscal year. So you can kind of see that it started that downward trend and then in 20 11, this last fiscal year, we actually dipped below that horizontal 4% line, which is what we are required by Nevada Administrative Code to budget at the beginning of our budget um, every, every fiscal year. So we can go below that. It's not a great thing to dip that heavily into your savings, obviously, but um, we are allowed to do that as long as the next fiscal year we start budgeting that level back up to 4% when we're going through our planning process. The other type is contingency, and that is a specific line item in our general fund budget. Um, it's a, I like to call it our savings account per se. Um, a number of years ago, the council made the wise decision to set aside some additional funds so that we have them for a rainy day. And as you can see in 2010 and 11, it rained. And um, in basically uh, 2012, I'm showing you right here that we've got a, a little more than $2 million in that um, contingency account, but I have adequately warned council folks that um, barring no significant uh, reductions in expenditures or rather in revenues or increases in expenditures, um, we, we would have that. We're not going to have that just this fiscal year. We're not going to go completely dry, but we're going to have to rely on that funding source and that rainy day fund um, once again this fiscal year. In the long term though, we are putting together solid fund policies so that we as your financial folks at the city can build into place a, a solid reserve level that's adequate enough to weather us through another one of these economic downturns without significant impacts such as layoffs, such as um, degradation of service levels, deferred capital maintenance, things of that nature. So we're very, very aware 
um, it, you know, things have been good, and again, it was, it was good planning that had us uh, being able to use this resource, but we are very, very aware that um, we need to focus hard on rebuilding these, these items that serve as safety nets for us. Revenues. Uh, two of our major revenues are ad valorem tax and C tax. Ad valorem, or is commonly referred to as property tax, uh, and C tax, consolidated tax, is a conglomeration of a number of taxes. Primarily, 80% of it is uh, sales tax. Uh, then about 15% of it is your government services tax, which is on your vehicles. If you, when you register your car, you see that everyone wonders what that government services tax is on their car and where it goes to. Some of it comes here, comes to, some to the schools. Um, there's also liquor tax uh, for hard liquor, uh, cigarette tax, and real property transfer tax. Those all kind of are lumped together countywide and then distributed down at the local levels. Um, we get about 29% of it on average within uh, the city of Reno with what's distributed to the county. Uh, this is a bright spot for us. Uh, tax has been going up month over month, actually the last six months. The year over year increase has been, you see the little numbers there, and 11% in December was a really good month. Uh, that's, a, that's a high month anyways, Christmas sales. And to have a big increase that month was really good. So, you know, that's the positive part of the revenue. Uh, that's about the most positive we have in our doom and gloom speech here. Uh, ad valorem, though, is continuing to decrease. We're looking next year for about a 45 to 5% decrease in ad valorem, uh, which in some ways is actually good. We had originally projected up to a 10% reduction, uh, but it's actually looking at about 45 to 5%. Um, just to give you an idea of C-tax over the last several years and where we're looking in the future, um, you can see back in tw 2008 we had over $51 million of C-tax. Uh, this year we're looking at about $40 million. So that's, that's a huge decrease for the city uh, in our revenues. Uh, we're looking at only a small increase in 2013 and 14. Um, some people will say, well, if you're seeing these increases, why aren't you seeing big increases into next year? Part of it goes into the Nevada Revised Statutes and how they do the distribution of the C-tax and uh, whether we're going to go to a, a different calculation next year, it's probably very likely so. We're looking at a 1% increase in C-tax uh, for next year and then uh, small increases in 14 and 15. Uh, ad valorem, the property tax, uh, as you can see, we're looking at, uh, we talked about the 45 to 5% decrease. Next year, uh, one of the things that everyone looks at is the anomaly here. You see the bubble, actually, you know, property values started decreasing in 2007, 2008 timeframe, but you see, wow, your, your property taxes are still going up. Have to remember, years ago, the legislature passed a bill that capped how much your property taxes increased per year. It was 3% for personal, 8% for commercial. So there was what we call an abatement in your taxes. And it took a while for that abatement, you know, as your property values went up and then down, your property tax was still less than what the value was. But it, so it took a while. It just kind of moved the bubble out to 2010 and then it dropped off. Uh, we're hoping, uh, maybe optimistically, 2014 there won't be any decreases, probably won't be any increases. Uh, talking to a lot of the Builders Association and the commercial brokers, and uh, it, it, we're hoping in 2015 there will be a start a recovery of the property values and there may be an increase. However, again, because when I talked about that cap, even if property values shot up through the roof, we can only go up 3% a year for personal property and 8% for commercial, and even that's tied to CPI, so it, it's not a large increase. Uh, this is everything put together, just, uh, you know, ad valorem. C-tax is probably about 60 to 70% of our revenue. There are other revenues, franchise fees and uh, this, the like. Most of those are fairly flat. Um, and, but you can see there's a big decrease in 2013. Again, that's the Truckee Meadows Fire Protection District uh, payment for fire services. And of course, the associated expenditures decrease also. Um, but again, you see our revenues are going to be flat for the next several years. Um, not much change. 
So we've talked about reserves and we've talked about revenues, and here we're going to match up uh, revenues and expenditures and see how they compare. And I'm going to make the editorial note because some of you numbers folks might be pouring through this later, um, that the revenues that you saw on the previous slide, I think it was 100, for 2011, was 168, I think, million. But these numbers are changing daily, but the, the important um, takeaway here is to look at how from 2008, 9, 10, and 11 fiscal years, our revenues were definitely outpacing our expenditure, our, let me reverse that, our expenditures were definitely outpacing our revenues, which put us into the need to use those contingency and stabilization accounts. You can see what that was happening there. Um, since we've prepared this presentation a couple days ago and posted it, the 20, uh, 2012, the current fiscal year that we're in, is we are, ba we are balanced. Um, we're going to end the fiscal year, um, you know, without a, a, a shortfall in that regard. So, you know, no layoffs, no cuts in service, that kind of thing. Um, and then we go into the future years, 13, 14, and 15, um, which is the point of this slide, to show you that if we don't do anything around expenditures, and that's just kind of keeping things at status quo, 84% of our expenditures, which are personnel, um, what we see here is we've applied a 3% cap. That's that little kind of pink or salmon colored cap that you see on the top of the expenditure bar. That depicts the 3% that we're conservatively estimating would be um, not cost of living increases, but rather costs um, for benefits and for um, existing um, contracts, labor contracts, things of that nature. So you can see where we start to go right back into the, the trend where um, expenditures are outpacing revenues and we're kind of right back where we started. And so one of the things that we're taking a hard and fast look at is what can we do in that regard to um, take a look at the, the bulk majority of our expenditures around people and what we can do to kind of hone in on making sure that we don't get back into the, into the downward spiral of that. So that's what we're um, depicting in this slide. And I apologize, the quo of status quo got cut off in our little box there in those, in those out years. Oh, I do, you know what, I did want to mention on that last slide. This was the, s the trigger slide that we shown, uh, showed during the Council Strategic Pri Priority Session um, back in the end of February, where in 2012 we had, there was a little bit more significant gap at that time because it was February. Um, and the paper headline, I think many of you remember, it was a $7.5 million shortfall for the city of Reno. That's where that number came from, from the paper. Um, it didn't take into account a lot of, uh, of factors that we have, have obviously factored in since then, um, where we realistically were with supplies and services. Usually we budget that we're going to spend all of those, but after taking a second look and readjusting and all that sort of thing, that's what you see today. That's why it's unfortunate that things get promoted the way that they are, but um, you're not seeing the $7.5 million gap here that, tr that will trigger any more headlines, thankfully. Speaking of headlines, uh, <laughs> city bond debt. Uh, this is our bond debt outstanding um, for the last several years and looking forward based on the bond payments. Uh, a couple of things to note, if you look at the slide, the blue at the bottom is what we call general obligation bonds. GEO bonds are the full faith and credit of the city of Reno to make the payments of those bonds. From our general fund revenues, just whatever the revenues are, we're going to make those bond payments. Um, and y as you can see, that's a small percentage, or it's good size, but it's not a huge amount of the bonds that we have outstanding. The green on the top is a special assessment district bonds. Those are tied to your uh, local improvements, sidewalk improvements, street lights that may occur in your neighborhood or a park. Uh, those bonds, again, are a small segment of the bonds outstanding. And in the middle, that purpley color there is what we call the revenue bonds. Revenue bonds are where a certain stream of revenue is pledged to the bonds. And a good example is the retract bonds. There's a 1 8 percent sales tax countywide that is pledged to those revenue bonds. Uh, that is all that's pledged to them, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, you know, they're not going to come and take the trench away. What they will do is they will come and take that one eighth percent sales tax, and that's all they, they get. And because they're revenue bonds, they're a uh, slightly higher risk. And the bond buyers know this when they buy the bonds. It's in the official statements. I can, if you pull up the, any of our official statements, uh, it talks about the risk involved in purchasing those bonds, and these banks and these Wall Street investment investors know what they're doing. They're very sophisticated. 
they have purchased the bonds with the risk, and because they're higher risk, we pay a slightly higher interest rate on a revenue bond than you would on a GO. GOs offer a lower interest rate. A good example is your home mortgage, usually is a ho lower interest rate than a credit card because a credit card is unsecured. So I'd like to point out that you know a lot of the bond debt that is talked about for the city of Reno is from pledged revenue, whether it's a retract one eighth percent or it's room tax downtown in the downtown area or other places, uh, it is not the general obligation of the city for these debts. Uh, these are our debt payments. Um, uh, you know, as you can see, we're running about thirty-eight, <coughs> forty million dollars a year in debt payments uh, for that those bonds there is going to be a jump in 2014 as you can see part of that is um, speaking of the retract bonds again there were actually two bonds issued as part of the outstanding bonds for the retract currently one of them has a forbearance or a, a payment holiday through June 2013 in which case uh, we will have to start making payments on those bonds again uh, so there is a, a leap in 2014 for those bond payments and that continues on. Um, and speaking of uh, obligations, uh, this is what uh, Kate had referred to earlier when she was talking about um, changes in reporting. Back in 2007, actually the pronouncement came in 2004, but it wasn't required until 2007 fiscal year. Cities and counties, local governments started having to report other post-employment benefits. Uh, other post-employment benefits up until then had never been reported on the financial statements, so a lot of people never paid any attention to them. Well, now they're out there and there's a lot of discussion, and the city of Reno is really no different than it, any other municipality or county across this country. There's a lot of articles. If you do a Google of OPEB, you, you know, I'm sure will find many articles about OPEB. OPEB is other post-employment benefits, primarily for us, medical insurance. So that when I retire, the city of Reno will pay my medical insurance for a period of time up until age 65 or depending on my contract, you know, a lifetime benefit. Those costs have not been, nobody has been putting any money aside for those payment of those benefits. We are doing what is called pay as you go, which is again what most municipalities have been doing, a pay as you go. Um, the actuarial amount of the pay-as-you-go is $250 million, as you see there. If we close the city of Reno June 30th, 2011, we would have to have $250 million to make the payments for all the obligations that the city has incurred up until that point. Now, that sounds very bad and doom and gloom, but that's over 40, 50 years worth of probably actually longer because we're living longer. I'd like to live a little longer. Um, of the life of our employees. And it's actuarial based, so there, it can change based on the actuarial report and the life and the, the, what the benefits are, but it gives you an idea of some unfunded liabilities that the city has outstanding. Uh, and then the other slice you see up there is the workers' compensation slice. Uh, the workers' compensation slice, you may have read in the paper uh, this fall, discussions about the city having a negative cash balance in the workers' comp fund. Well, that had been corrected this year. However, we have not been reserving for workers' comp. That means uh, primarily a lot of this is a heart and lung. Some of it is the IBNR incurred but not reported. Um, and, you know, an example I use is sometimes if somebody gets injured, you may have a reoccurring injury in the future. We, we are making the current payments on those injuries and those medical costs, and but we are not putting any aside for the future. Because if I get injured today, I may have to go back to the doctor next year to get reconstructive surgery. Uh, I know it looks like I need reconstructive surgery, but uh, come on. Um, but you know, I may need to go back to the doctor next year. So I, we have not in, uh, reserved any of those monies, and that's about $36 million. Um, you know, just kind of giving you a little split between uh, the, the current split between the enterprise fund and the governmental funds. And then, since, you know, I, I'm on a roll here with you, <laughs> um, 
the, one of the other things that we need to be looking at is our capital. Um, we are not, have not been funding our capital maintenance program the way we should. Uh, and anyone that has, uh, has a swimmer or has gone to the Reno Police Department or some of the other facilities knows that some of our facilities are, are, are getting a little worn. And normally you should be putting money aside to make those capital improvements and or doing those capital improvements kind of as a pay as you go. Uh, in the last couple of years, due to the fiscal uh, issues we've been having, we have not been uh, doing much maintenance in the way of uh, capital improvements, maintenance. And what we see here is about $40 million is what the depreciation is that has not been uh, recaptured. We have, if you, just to give you an idea, the $40 million, we, were, we couldn't really come up with a number of our capital improvements that we needed to do. It's a rather large number, but on a go-forward basis, you should be putting aside about what your depreciation is for capital improvements and capital maintenance. And our depreciation, less capital expenditures, is about $40 million for this year. Uh, sewer, uh, we just actually just had a rate increase, um, so they're in really good shape. Uh, the net for fiscal year 12 was $3 million, but uh, they had a rate increase, so things are improving for them, um, and they're, you know, they have a lot of capital improvements that they need to do. If you're on North Virginia Street, you can see that big project going on, and they're actually in good shape. That is one area where we're in very good shape on, and that's Mr. Flansburg. You can thank for that. Um, so out of all the doom and gloom, we do come forward with solutions. And those of you fortunate enough to inherit the council priorities that um, were set, this solution to create um, strategies that foster economic progress and stability is one of those strong priorities that the council did adopt during their planning session. And so under that solution or priority, we have identified five critical components um, that we are building and currently working on um, developing and actively pursuing, and that includes the funding for services, looking at our assets, um, getting our debt uh, under control, and, and seeing what we can do to reduce our expenditures around that. And then um, I mentioned looking at reserves and replenishing those items, and then uh, future and, and current employee liability is one of those uh, items that we'll take a look at. And I'll go through these in a little more detail in the rest of the slides, but I do want to leave you guys some time for questions. So. Um, Funding core services, this is what I mentioned earlier in regard to prioritizing what it is that we do, what is it that we should do, you know, how often, those types of things. Um, we are looking at more clearly aligning our funding sources and those uses so that things are a little more streamlined and transparent for when people like me come in and try to wrap my head around the budget and where all of the funding sources are going and, and the utilization of those resources. And so we're, we're doing a great job at um, progressively looking to make that a little more clear. Um, we are taking a look at diversifying our funding base. We're going to uh, continue to um, target revenue streams. You'll see that we released a transparency, uh, around our transparency effort, we released a, an online checkbook, and that was in um, February. Sorry, I keep forgetting that. Uh, in February, where you can go in and look at a department and drill down to see what their expenditures were. And then in June, I think it is that we anticipate showing the payroll piece of that. So you get to see what all of us fine folks here um, are making at the city of Reno. And in addition, what we've done is an all-hands effort around the departments asking them, hey, what can we do to streamline processes? You know, you guys are on the front lines doing all this. It shouldn't, this decision shouldn't be made in a bubble. Um, and really engaging the employees, we can continue to do that around what are some of the things that we can improve, what are the processes, processes that we can improve, you know, where can we save some resources because I think everybody at this point knows that it, we're a highly functioning system here at the city of Reno and that, you know, everybody's kind of in it for the right reasons. So it's been a, an all hands, um, an all team effort around figuring out what we can do to fund those core services because that's what we're in the business of doing is providing those services to the, to the citizenry. Uh, yeah, w one of the things we're doing is developing an asset management approach, uh, making sure we maximize what assets we do have. That's primarily what we're looking at is equipment, building, and land. Uh, one of the things we're doing is consolidating offices into this building, 1E1, 1 East 1 East 1st Street. Uh, 
uh, community development, which is out on Sinclair up by the old city hall, is going to be moving into this facility. We're kind of moving people around within this building. Uh, and then we can lease or sell the Sinclair building. Um, we're also looking at other parcels we may have that uh, we don't really need to utilize. Of course, a lot of our assets um, land are parks or fire stations or drainage facilities. So it, it's not like we're going to be able to sell off a park or a drainage facility. That's what our role and purpose is. But we want to make sure what we have is what we really need to have. So we're coming up with that strategic real estate plan, uh, deferring assets when appropriate, uh, and identifying and selling any excess equipment, whether it's even uh, excess furniture or uh, rolling stock uh, vehicles. And then refined debt management plan. Uh, what we're looking at is, and what we have already done, is gone through with our bond advisor and bond council and our financial advisory board, which is our citizens finance board, and looked at all of our debt and said, what can we do? Is there anything we can do for each of these bond issues? We have about 40 of those bonds that you saw were are about 40 of them are outstanding. Is there anything we can do on any of them to improve our position, reduce our payments, uh, reduce our costs, um, anything at all? And so we've got a couple ideas we're going to look at and do a little more research on and go forward with. And so that's something we're trying to do is looking at maximizing it and making sure everything is uh, as appropriate as possible. So I mentioned um, the large chunk of our budget being personnel. And so one of the things we need to do around those liabilities that we have, the unfunded liabilities with the workers' compensation and the um, other post-employment benefits is we can establish a trust where any resources that we dedicate via a fund policy or other mechanism can go into that trust and it can only be used for the sole purpose of paying down that obligation. And so that is a GASB recommended, which is an accounting um, standard recommended principle and, and we haven't had one to this point. So that's one of those small steps that we can take to further ourselves in that regard. Um, we are, as I mentioned, looking at future employee benefits. What do we need to do around those so that when folks come to the city to work, they have an expectation around, um, you know, it's not going to be perhaps as rosy as it always has been. You know, it's, I, I think the days are long gone of the cush government job, that's for sure. But um, I think that there are, there are some areas that we can focus in on that, that don't have grave impact to the employees and that really can help us align those resources. Um, our city attorney's office has taken management of our risk fund, our risk management fund, and done a, a great job at really getting that um, in alignment and kind of hitting that hard. So that's been a really good area for us to um, plan to fund for some of these liabilities. And then, as always, we need to take a hard and fast look at legis legislative changes that we can do throughout all five of these principles and come up with a strategic legislative plan so that we can best use our time um, every other year when we go to session so that we can make the changes necessary because there are some provisions that prohibit us from moving forward um, fiscally just because there are laws or statutes or administrative code provisions that are in place that have pro prohibited us from doing that. So um, I talked a little bit about future employee liability um, and so what I really wanted to leave everybody thinking about was that um, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. The path is not an easy one um, that we're taking, but we are committed to it. And you have a very strong city manager and executive staff that are looking to drive us in the right direction and better position the city in the future for, again, us to weather a significant, um, if equal if not more, um, economic downturn. And so with that, um, I'm going to open it up, I think, to questions. But um, thank you all again for your um, interest in the position. And we look forward to potentially working with some of you in the future. Thanks. Yeah, I, I don't know that they told you we're recording this, I guess. So <laughs> against my better judgment and uh, my express wishes not to be fit, photoed, so. Are you Amish? Yes, I am. Oh. <laughs> so, a, a, anybody have any questions? Thank you. I have a question with regards to the um, trust fund that you say you're, you're going to establish with regards to the post-employment benefits. Where, where is that in the, in the process and how do you see that being funded? Well, that's something where we have no way to fund it right now. It's not in the budget, but what we're looking for is, is oh, we got another one, oh good. Uh, as we get more, whenever we 
our view is whenever we have excess revenues in an area, we would like to start putting it into that, those trusts to pay down those liabilities. We have not established that trust at this time. Uh, we're just working on the budget for 2013, and as we develop that, we're going to see what kind of resources we have to apply to whether it's the OPEB liability, the workers' comp liability, or any other of our uh, unfunded liabilities. And then, of course, council will prioritize which ones will be the priority. Do you want to? My question. My, it's on. Okay. My question is about the uh, the effective rates of the variable of the bonds that you have, and if they're all fixed or variable rates, and if you've been involved in swaps, and I know the city has been. It's been very uh, difficult time, I guess, for swaps. Could you explain a little bit about how that's structured? Uh, we, we actually have a mix of variable rate and fixed rate uh, bonds, and we do have two bonds with swaps. Actually, the retract bonds have a swap on them, and the downtown event center bonds have a swap on them. And as you know, the interest rates are so low right now that uh, to unwind those swaps would be probably 20 or $30 million, which would be cost prohibitive. Um, the ones that are variable rates, uh, there are a, couple of them, they're usually tied, most of them are tied to the LIBOR, which actually at this time has been very good. LIBOR is about a quarter of a percent. So uh, that's that's a good news. Um, but And they're capped at the top end also, um, depending on the bond. Like I said, there's about 40 bonds, so we have... What about the general obligation bond? Uh, mo the, most of the general obligations are fixed, and when I say they're fixed, some of them will have multiple issues within them. So they're, 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 the combined rate is variable depending on what year you're in, but they're all fixed rate bonds. And what's the effective rate? Average effective rate. <laughs> uh, hold on. <laughs> Uh, for the general obligation bonds, the uh, effective interest rates are, uh, for the street improvement bond is from 3 to 5 percent. Again, because depending on what the issue, the term of each of the bonds are when the bonds are issued, some of them are five-year, six-year, seven-year, et cetera. Um, pardon? Yeah, actually, do you want to maybe just, there's a lot of them. Not, uh, uh, yeah, I have the for each bond, but not combined total. There's a lot. Yeah. The the question was: uh, uh, Is the city uh, is the city band paid? The municipal band, and and actually they are volunteers. Um, I believe there there might be a small stipend for the the conductor, the leader of the band. Um, but that's it, that's minimal. Uh, the the musicians are uh, volunteers. Oh, yeah. Yes, please. Hi, for the record, I'm Christine Fay. I'm the Arts and Culture uh, Manager and Resource Development Director. So, um, the answer to the question is: We do have a. For years, we paid the band members. But then last year, due to the economic downturn, we were very fortunate because Mac McGranahan, who is our band leader now, uh, f put together a volunteer band. At some point, we would hope to be able to pay the band members again. And so the donations that come in, we don't keep. Those go to the band members. So everything that's donated gets put right back out to the band. I brought it up just so that people know that the band's not getting paid. No, no, that's that's very true. And they do get a stipend at the end of the season, and last year they were able to get some money because we were able to raise some uh, money through grants and then also the, the obvious donations that you just mentioned. So anyone who loves the band should absolutely donate to it because it's one of the fun things that uh, our city has had for many, many, many years. Any other questions? Uh, about code enforcement. The police does that that come under the city the code enforcement or is that your guys' property? City. City. Do you have any involvement at all? We work. Uh, we're, we're, we collaborate all the time. Uh, we work with, uh, doing special events or any any major project stuff like that. They're working on. There's usually a team of us that kind of work together. I, I want to uh, suggest that uh, you get. 
done a great job over the last three years. I know it's been really challenging in having to uh, cut the budgets and lay off folks, and I, I suspect, uh, not to say we're out of the woods yet, um, but there's certainly a, a lot of the, the heartache is um, hopefully behind, uh, behind us. Uh, though I, I would assume, though, there's still some room for some efficiencies within our government. Um, what action steps are being, uh, are, are being taken to, again, attempt to be as efficient as possible so that we will find some reserves uh, to put to, towards some of those unfunded liabilities. We actually have a, a lean, what we call a lean process improvement that we went through. And I don't know, John, do you want to talk about, um, since you were most familiar with that, um, this is John Flansburg, our director of, of public works. Um, and, and we've gone through this process and actually we're identifying other areas where we can go through the same process. So John, you want to, to speak to what we have done? Thank you. Uh, uh, for the record, I just gotta get used to saying that. Uh, John Slansford, Director of Public Works. Uh, for the uh, uh, lean process, uh, we take a look, and, and it works really best if you're looking at things that you do often. So it's daily or multiple times a day. And if you're looking for a particular result, like trying to lower the cost, reduce waste, improve efficiency, those types of things. So one of the items that we used that on was the business license approach and went through the business license. How can we expedite that process? Uh, reduce the number of steps that have to be taken with that, deliver a better customer service, and reduce costs. And so that was one of the items that we take. One of the ones that came, we're, we have one more process improvement that we're going to be going in with a certain consultant that we're using, but the idea behind using this consultant was after three processes, training people internally so we can be doing some of these things internally. So uh, the last one we're going to be looking at, uh, we're, we're going to define what that is, but a couple of items that came up is our accounts receivable. Uh, making sure how that process goes. There might be some ways we can improve efficiencies in that area. So those are some of the things that we have done uh, to look at that, as well as a myriad of things that we've looked at the last several years in our operations. I have a question back here. For our assistant police chief, uh, how many outlying areas do you have to patrol, and what is the coverage in those areas, like STED and, and things like that? Well, typically, uh, yeah, so STED is... Uh, we usually have one to two officers out there at any given time um, and the way our supervisors kind of staff the, the streets is to make sure that we keep, we get enough people kind of in that northern area that if they, if they need more resources we can get it up there fairly quick. Um, but for the most part, majority of our, our time is spent down in, in the majority of the, of the city area. You know, uh, we're obviously growing south we, or we grew south so we spent a lot of time, you know, down all the way to the Double Diamond area. So. About how many outlying areas are there that you have to cover? Well, we cover uh, really uh, almost, and there's, there's pieces that we cover almost to the state line if you go west, uh, and then you, we've got uh, some parts of Cold Springs uh, to the north. Um, we go, uh, you know, as, as far south, uh, you, know, you know, down to almost the Mount Rose Highway, you know, in some areas. So, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, you know, it's a pretty big, you know, it's a 105 square mile geographical area. Um, any given shift, we may have uh, a total of, of maybe 30 officers deployed, you know, throughout, throughout that area. But they're always out driving around, you know, waiting for those calls, responding to those calls. So. Thanks. On? Okay. A number of times I've heard people use the phrase managed competition as one of the strategies you're hoping to employ that will give us some advantages. Can you elaborate a little bit as to how you envision using that concept and what areas of government it might be used in? Be happy to fill that one. Uh, so managed competition, what, what you do with that, there, there's a couple ways you can look at doing that. Some people call it outsourcing. And, and kind of the difference between the managed competition process and an outsourcing process is sometimes in outsourcing, you just put a service out to, uh, to contract and you compare the quotes you have coming in from that versus the costs that you have in your, in your own internal operations. Compare the two and see if there's a benefit in, in actually outsourcing that versus retaining that in-house. The difference with managed competition is you actually first focus on your internal operation and see what, if there's anything you can do to improve on that operation and make it as efficient as you possibly can first. And then once you've accomplished that and you've established a, a little bit of history, a few months or so, depending on what the operation is, then you go out and you bid the same service and make sure that things line up, that the same service is being bid that the one that you're providing internally. And then based on the cost there, then you make the decision from that. 
Mr. Klinger, so as you know, the legislature casts a, a really large shadow over everything that the city of Reno does. And I was just wondering if you saw any opportunities in the future where the city can beef up its ability to, to correspond and, and work with legislators, um, hopefully so that they can pass laws or do things that can help us with some of these long-term budget issues. We actually, uh, one of my assistant city managers is uh, Cadence Matijevich, who um, is in charge of our, our government relations. And, and part of um, Cadence's job is to establish those relationships with the Washoe delegation. And one of the things that, that we've done is we've invited the, the Washoe delegation to come in um, every month and we update them on, on issues that we have, get their feedback on items. And so it's really more, it's about communication and developing relationships with them. Um, I mean, I don't know if you're, if you have something specific that you're looking for other than that or Okay. They're, they're, they're very responsive um, to us. I mean, there's several interim committees that we're also involved in. There's actually one, uh, Robert alluded to it a little bit, there's a committee that's actually looking at the structure uh, of the sea tax, and so we're engaged in that process um, with them as well. And, and we keep our, again, not all of our delegation is on that committee, so we keep them informed um, on what our position is, uh, you know, moving forward on those issues. I have a question here. Um, I'm curious, has the city entertained the idea of making a move to home rule as opposed to Dillon's? I think that idea has been floated many, many times. Cadence, if you want to come up and, and, and fill in on that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate enough to have experience both now at the local level and at the state level. Um, and I think it would be a challenge to get the legislature to ever give up that authority and, and give it to the uh, to local government. And Cadence, if you want to add to that, I, pick your battles. Um, I guess is is the best way to summarize that. We, there has been a, a lot of talk about home rule in the in the past couple of legislative sessions. There was a bill in the 2011 session that had to do with a component of home rule and what they called. Um, functional home rule, so kind of our day-to-day -day operations, and was there an appetite at the legislature um, even just to give us that piece? And I will tell you that, unfortunately, that was met with a great deal of resistance. Um, and, and I think given where we are today, um, you know, the, the unfortunate circumstances that the state and local government have found themselves in, um, you know, some of the, the financial policies um, of, of our local government and other local governments throughout the state unfortunately have left the legislature um, with, a, with a lack of confidence um, in, in local government's ability uh, to, to behave responsibly. Not that necessarily we deserve that, but that's the reality of the situation. I mean, I, I sort of joked with them. Um, it, it, in the testimony on that functional home rule bill, I said, you know, give us our learner's permit. Um, and they said, nope, we're terrified. We're, you, get to keep, you get to stay in the back seat. So, it, you know, as we look at the, at the ways that we can do things, and, and I think to, to Mr. Kelly's question, we've taken a little bit different approach of, um, you know, for a long time there has been a push to separate ourselves and say, let us operate independently, and that perhaps given uh, where we are today, that, that a more productive strategy would be to engage them um, educate them as to the challenges that we face um, and make them part of the solutions around that rather than um, distancing ourselves from them. Um, in any organization, obviously, communication is key. How often um, does staff meet with council members and is it as a on the whole or is it individually? What is that process? We're, we're meeting with council members and, and it really depends um, on the issue. I mean, I meet with the, the council members on a regular basis. Um, you know, we, we really want the council members to, to funnel their requests through me um, because if I'm going to be held accountable for the actions of the organization, I really need to know um, what's going on. But, but council does reach out occasionally to staff to find out the status of a project uh, and, and inquire where we are on something. Um, so we're, we're in regular communication um, you know, with the council members. I have standing meetings um, with all of them at least once a month just to go over issues um, and, and you know, update them on projects that are of interest particularly to them.
<laughs> you paid your money and you walked out the door and that was it. Okay? You had to make your own signs, you didn't know where to put them, you didn't get any information at all. When I checked with the city clerk, she gave me this nice little brochure of what to do. You guys are very fortunate. I want to command, congratulate you guys for doing a good job with this. We all need this. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If not, we have staff that will stick around afterwards if you want to ask them uh, questions individually. And, and thanks again for being here, and, and thanks again for running.